huge thanks. I, when I got the text from Chris, humbled, honored, um, and I just want to take a second to say a huge kudos to Chris, the basketball immersion crew, the golden ticket crew, to so such tremendous big picture thinking to include so many different levels, uh, so many different contexts. Thanks to all of you tuning in. If you're investing in yourself, that means you're investing in your players. So thanks for that. I read an article about Chris recently, uh, Chris, basketball immersion Chris, uh, and it was touting Canadian coaching. And the more that I watch both athletes and coaches travel internationally and have basketball experiences in other places, I couldn't agree with them more. There's so much good stuff happening here at different levels. Um, and in particular, <laughs> shout out, I just think there's amazing. Um, as a warning, I'm about to share way too much information. But given the broadness of the audience and not a lot of interaction in this particular context, uh, it seemed wise to cast a really big net with many, many ideas. And I'm hoping something sticks for you. Uh, and maybe even something can make you go, coaching psychology, who am I and why does it matter? Uh, hopefully by the end of this, you're going to share my thought that it does matter. So first things first. Very teachery of me, uh, but I do want to try and get you involved a little bit in a few bullet points based on your experiences, your reflections, feedback from trusted sources over the years. If you retire today, what would your toast reveal about you? Maybe like, I don't know, 20 seconds of think time. Guess I could have played the music now. Okay. Again, being a teacher, I know half of you aren't doing it. Maybe a couple of you are. Uh, why am I asking you to do this? As I'm going through everything, I hope that you're able to take the ideas and always be thinking, how can I apply this to myself? Bigger, bigger picture. This is your why. In theory, it drives your motivation to continue to show up every day and to continue to get better. So if this gives you purpose, then let this be the reason why understanding some of your psychological tendencies might make a big difference. So goals of the session, we're gonna to try to bring conscious awareness to your own psychological profile. I'm gonna to try to share some practical strategies and perspe perspectives to enhance or improve and in some cases even cover up those tendencies. I'd like to ensure for me, and hopefully help you, that the what I am doing lines up with my stated why. Uh, and you know what? A big piece, hopefully I can model some vulnerability here. I'm going to normalize struggle through some funny stories, through some not so funny stories. But I hope this sticks with you. Coaching isn't hard because you're doing it wrong. It's hard because you're doing it, period. The first time I heard that phrase, the word life was in there. But I was like, this, this is just like coaching. And anchoring it all, which is why I chose a red font, I know, brilliant. Uh, the who and the why equals your what and your how. So going a little bit more deeply into all of this, you can only make change if you're aware of it. You may just not know your psychological profile. It does make sense. It also changes sometimes depending on context or who you're with. Uh, definitely tons of this stuff applies to athletes. But the coaching side of it doesn't get much play. So I was like, I don't know, give it a whirl here. Uh, and arguably, if we can improve the mental performance of our athletes, which probably in theory we all agree with, we could make the argument that the same is true if we can improve our own mental performance. While you hopefully find some of this interesting, that's not my goal. Um, again, we want to try and get you applying. I've tried to frame it similarly where through each of these you know, psychological tendencies, etc. cetera, their strengths and weaknesses. So this is just like putting together a training plan or a competition plan where we're gonna want to play to our strengths and again, work on our weaknesses and know which ones to just straight up cover up as I mentioned. So your worst offender probably isn't getting your key matchup in the game. Um, we'll try and sort of do that similarly. I'm gonna share my experiences and often my mistakes that led to my awareness or deeper dives of introspection. Now, I tend to be from one end of the spectrum, uh, a little more sort of towards the self-doubt side. Much research shows this often lines up along sex and gender lines, um, but I'm going to also try very hard to present the other end of the hypothetical spectrum, knowing that 
hopefully you can find yourself somewhere in, in between uh, and figure out what might need to stick for you. Huge shout out, last thing, to the people I'm borrowing ideas from or using in my stories. So I've had amazing people help mentor me, teach me, uh, be patient with me. Uh, Carly Clark, Mike McKay, Agnes Borg, Bryce Tully, Lou Walsh, Dr. Hanley Defoe, Danny Sinclair, Brene Brown, and so, so many people. Uh, I do believe I'm, you know, basically here because I'm standing on top of their heads. So my why. The gut check self-assessment for our program at Bill Carruthers is this. The first one's really helpful because it's measurable. Don't be their last coach. This one's a little bit more unique to the high school context. Maybe, maybe not, Hope not trying to offend anyone. But for me, my job is never at stake based on winning or losing. I don't even get paid. There's not even any pay that's at stake. So I really can be focused on the development piece as more than just a logical way to help us win. Secondly, and certainly much harder to measure, but great for sort of purposeful building, we are trying to build self-sufficient, interdependently minded student athletes. And since quarantine, I would add to that adaptable. So for us, self-sufficient in understanding or being open to understanding the game deeply. Uh, and for us, that means being part of the learning environment and being problem solvers, not just robots. It also means allowing them to make decisions that perhaps aren't always my first choice. So as an example, we ask them to come in and shoot twice before school. There is technically a tracking sheet, but at the end of the day, do it or don't do it. And then you got to let them manage the consequences. So, you know, if they're upset about playing time, this is a great way to sort of start an individual meeting or look at some of the journaling uh, that comes with it. We try very hard to create an environment that holds up growth and not, certain, and not certainty. So in our practices, being right is less important than learning and shifting behaviors. The interdependently part, what does that mean? In education, we're asked to meet learners where they are. So if we look at an example, um, and again, you're probably gonna be able to picture some faces as I talk about these. If you picture your sort of more codependent, or even we could call them a needy athlete on one end of the spectrum, and let's say you've got a super independent, maybe even ego-driven athlete on the other end of the spectrum, you still need to get buy-in from both of them and get them to buy into, you know, challenging themselves and challenging others. So interdependence serves both of them. On the one hand, you've got... I need to do this for my team and with my team so I feel a sense of belonging in our culture. On the other end, you've got somebody saying, well, if I make my teammates look good, well, I can look good, so I guess we better figure it out together. It's this mutual idea, uh, and I find it goes a long way. And then the biggest quarantine lesson that I've made through interacting with high school kids every single day in some sort of virtual setting, the greatest life skill that we probably need to include in this day and age with so much rapid change is being adaptive, uh, adaptable. The paradox of teaching and learning is that we talk a big game about preparing kids for the future, but we don't actually know what that looks like, what that means. So we really have to help them be adaptable. As I go through the presentation, I hope the lessons I share and the strategies I share will help build up my why statements. So starting somewhere. In my early years, ignorance is, was bliss, but probably not very constructive. There was peace in not knowing what I didn't know. It freed me up to be all about my why and just jump in and be happy for the opportunity. It also revealed both ways, winning and losing never tell the whole story. So my first competitive head coaching roles were with Team Ontario. That's an interesting starting point. 
And the roster was ridiculous. When you look back, I think there's three athletes that are currently within that sort of 16 Olympic pool. Um, so I coach what I knew so far, as, as we all probably do. Stuff from my playing past, my early assistant coaching with York, stuff from my teacher's college, my sociology degree. But we won. We won a lot. So <laughs> how did I know I was, like, doing okay or I was on the right track? I had So Kia Nurse was on these first couple teams. She was sort of with Team Ontario and then with the under-16, under-17 national team uh, all through her teenage years. Um, and so she was there and engaged in the environment. And her dad, Richard, who some of you may know, competitive guy, awesome with his X's and O's, a great coach in his, in his own right, never said anything, was super respectful, but I could always just kind of feel or see him just sort of watching. And, and it was, I don't know how to explain it. He just didn't know exactly what was happening. And I think on one hand, he was like, what are they doing? We're playing small-sided games. We're probably talking about our feelings in some way. Um, but at the end of the day, and, and, and many years later, he said, I know you care for my kid. I trusted you. And she got better. Right. So that, that was enough. That was enough for me at the time to know, OK, I'm on the right track. As we started in competition, I started to see things and hear things that I didn't get. I didn't know what was going on, but I didn't feel pressure or expectations early. And a huge reason for that was Ontario basketball and Michelle O'Keefe in particular. She had been very deliberate in recruiting me, giving me a chance and never making it about winning. It stays with me to this day knowing the power of tapping someone on the shoulder that may not see in themselves what you do yet, and then backing it up with a positive learning environment. The next piece about the winning losing, we were playing BC in New Brunswick, and this was the year where we didn't have the under 16, under 17, under 18 kids, the cadet and junior kids at that time. Sean McGinnis is super experienced, very well-respected coach, and basically tore our defense to shreds. My super sophisticated counter was to play some zone. He kept ball screening the wing. So on the ball reversal, we'd have to bump up from our bottom and he just killed us in the short corner. I didn't know exactly what was happening. So we just kind of kept switching defenses. Long story short, this was still just pool play, but we happened to win on a last second shot off of a broken play. That was the first time I knew we had escaped with a win, A, and B, I had been thoroughly outcoached. That's when I knew. Winning and losing aren't great metrics to know if you're being successful. I also started to realize just how much I had to learn, which was exciting and as you'll see, also overwhelming at times. Around this same time, I was brought onto the national team staff as an apprentice coach slash manager. Um, and I think that was because of my strengths. So there's some external validation there um, that they recognize the positive things that were being done in terms of, you know, the team building standpoint, the learning standpoint, um, and being on board with how they're teaching the game of basketball. So I leaned into it even more. But being around those amazing coaches kept reminding me how much of a gap there was between my basketball knowledge theirs. So the staff at that time was Carly Clark, Anya Borg, uh, and Andre Desjardins. Trying to make something of this now. We're going to look at basically four complementary things, but sort of look at them in two separate ways. We're going to look at broad focus versus narrow focus and sort of where you are and what that might mean, how you might be able to employ some things because of it. And then internal focus versus external focus. Take a second just to look at this. I'll give you a, a break from my voice. So before we can act on any of this, the awareness has to come first. I figured mine out through some tough mistakes that I only now can laugh at. See after I tell the stories if you can match whether I am narrow or broad. And we'll go a little bit deeper into internal, external later. Again, 
oftentimes they'll complement each other, but just bear with me. Exhibit A. This was the first or second summer of Team Ontario, uh, and a lot of our sort of pre-national stuff was going to A. We were in Washington, D.C. Stands are packed with kids, coaches, etc. We're near crunch time in a game. I'm starting to think of a sweet play to run. Starting to consider the sort of time score scenarios. I peek at the table, pop score clock by, you know, illegally running onto the court as we basically have to do. Um, and as I do that, I see the ball go out of bounds. It's in our offensive end, right around the hash marks. I take the time out. Got the whiteboard ready. I know exactly what I want to run. I diagram it. I'm in the zone. I'm making eye contact, doing the knee pat. Got it? And everyone's kind of looking at me funny. And that's when I realized we were actually on defense. I uttered something like, well, that's unfortunate. And we went out and we played defense. To reframe that, it was a great teachable moment to be able to own it and need to be better. It also made me have to really look at our culture. No one said anything to me. I had to give some thought to, to what kind of learning environment was it that that occurred. Exhibit B. Bronze medal game, world championships, Amsterdam. Not a big deal. It's not high stakes or anything. To review, I'm the manager slash apprentice coach at this juncture. This is a new role. I was lacking experience with logistics in general, ne never mind at a tournament of this magnitude. I was very aware of budget with laundry. Uh, it had to be sent out every night. It's in euros, big deal. Um, and I was so dialed in on getting things done and done correctly since it was all new and also because I wanted to be able to be the help with coaching stuff. So after we lost in the semis, we get back to the hotel. I pack up the laundry as I always do. Up until then, uniform color had basically been flip-flopping, so it didn't matter, light, dark, in terms of, you know, home and away. So that night, the laundry's done. I put it out. I give the other uniforms out so everybody's got them. Make the schedule, nighty-night kids, and then we're getting, you know, going on the scouting plan, etc. When we show up to the game the next day, I realize we're wearing the wrong color. And we literally do not have the other uniforms. They are out being laundered somewhere. So I'm trying not to stress out Carly with this silly but gigantic mistake. Of course she knew, probably on some level. Um, so I take the interpreter. So there's also a language barrier. And we have to go hunt down the tournament organizer, who I'm sure has nothing more important to be doing on championship day. Let's just say, thank God Japan was wearing black so we could wear our reds. And hey. Maybe that's why we won. Sorry, Carly, it just it might be. As you may have guessed, I am narrow focused generally uh, and, and do tend to be quite internal as well, which you'll see. As a bit of a pleaser growing up, and as many young women uh, do tend to be, I'm probably like those athletes that you have where when you're designing a play, you know, you'll talk about what might come open. So I'm the one that got the ball and turn down the wide open layup because you told me to reverse it to the wing. I, I'm a little bit like that person. I've worked hard to be able to expand all of this, and I have. Uh, I'm able to switch lenses, and I'm sure all of you are as well. But now that I know where my predisposition lies, again, I can plan. It gives me some control um, over what I do with it. So to give you a chance to do a little bit of a check on where you may lie, I'm just going to switch screens for a second here and get you to watch a little something. Hopefully there's no ad. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball.
as you may have guessed, I knew exactly how many passes White had made and completely missed the gorilla. Let's move on. So what does this all mean? And what can we do? At the end of the day, how can I ensure that the information I need is easily accessible when I need it? So whichever point of focus you have, whether you're narrow or broad, try to set up your assistant eyes or the injured player's eyes to complement it. So if you're broad, try to get them to watch something narrow. If you're narrow, try to get them to be tracking something a little bit more broadly. Um, some things that we do that help support my strengths, you know, obviously in giving staff still time to develop, um, are some of these things. So in practice plans, points of emphasis obviously help guide the assistance eyes. Um, and again, we set them up very deliberately. But it, it sets up my eyes to be able to be in the proper lens. And it does work to my strength as a narrow focused person. If I know exactly what we've deemed as important, I'm pretty good at watching that. Okay, where else do we see this? When you're doing competition planning, you've got to be able to prioritize what you want to know and who gets the information. So I might be trying to immerse myself in full game flow, like going, okay, broad focus here. Or if you are a broad focus person, you might want to know what's the ball screen coverage that they're coming at us with. Um, for me, because where I would say it still shows up for me, I can tell I'm not great with broad focus as a natural tendency because I think it means I'm present, but I tend to watch each possession um, as it's happening. And so we find it really helpful. We'll track possessions so that I can make connections. We can see trends. I've, I've like left that play behind. And so that helps us have some organization um, and, and sort of connect things. I also tend to delegate away individual debriefs because I like the narrow focus, which means I, I really like coaching an individual athlete. I would get too bogged down in that realistically. Um, and I probably want to do all of them. So we tend to delegate those away as well. Um, stoppages game reset. So since the timeout debacle of my youth, it took a lot away from that. If I know that there's a possibility that I'm going to miss some information, we take the first two seconds. So one coach has the role when we come into a stoppage, so quarter timeout, and we do um, basically a game reset. So where's the ball? What's our, you know, time score situation or foul situation? It brings us together as a staff. It helps to frame the timeout in what we want to say, but it also helps us stay focused on what's the next correct decision. And that essentially is the whole pursuit of competition coaching. It also helps catch bad refs if they happen to screw any of that stuff up. Something else we do, timeout bench setup is pretty on purpose. Uh, I have them sit positionally, position one through five, left to right. It gives them something to focus on. It makes them communicate. If they're out of position or didn't talk about it, I now also know right away we're probably not in a very good place. But that works to my strength of being pretty narrow focused and organized to be able to put it stuff on the whiteboard if and when I need it. Um, whiteboard prep, this is something else that's been amazing. If you have uh, an injured athlete or, you know, a younger kind of new inexperienced assistant coach, there's some risk to this one, but you might want to try it. You can have them put in real time. So as a sub comes in, they are always updating your whiteboard. So whether you use initials, you'll know who's on the floor in order on the margin of your whiteboard. Something else uh, that I have my assistants do that is tremendously helpful on their notes, so they're writing stuff down, there'll be just a little random note section. So as something comes into my head that I see, I get them to write it down. And again, for me, it might be a really important point. By the time we get to the timeout, it's just leaked out my ear. Like I don't remember it. And I know it was something important to give them to me. That way I can decide, is this the time or place to have to go back to that? With a strong assistant, uh, in the past, in late game scenarios, you know, you start to sort of see what's happening. You're probably pretty prepared, um, and you might already know or anticipate what's about to happen. Your assistant, if you're comfortable with it, might be able to already have the play 
on the whiteboard where you're, you're starting to think, you know, we're going to be advancing soon, running super secret, awesome play. Um, that allows, so instead of me now having to take 10 seconds to put people into position, that 10 seconds can be reinvested in us now talking about what's the anticipated coverage? What do we think is going to come open here? Uh, the ready sheet and situation prep. So pressure exacerbates your tendency. So I tend to get even narrower. So a play that I know back, left, forward, etc. It's shakier in a super pressure situation. So having the ready sheet be very organized and knowing, so I don't know, like five seconds or less, sideline, you need a two. We know what we're going to do. And if it's organized enough, and again, if you are using your assistant, they also could be going to it. Um, but I highly recommend having something that you can go to. Um, and the ready sheets have been a huge help for me. So we're going to start to go a little bit broader and sort of into the next chapter of my own career. Um, and I've sort of titled this imposter complex. So Harvard Business Review defines this as, and I quote, a collection of feelings of inadequacy that persist despite evident success. So plainly, as I rose through the ranks, so to speak, and had the opportunity to continue to be surrounded by unreal coaches, I just kept feeling more and more anxiety that people would discover that they'd made a mistake putting me in these roles. I am like the prototype of the system. I started in our like MDP, JDP, OSDP, whatever you call it, provincial development programs here, all through the ages. Then I was the under 15 provincial coach, under 17 provincial coach, manager, apprentice coach, national team, performance analyst, national team, assistant coach, national team, head coach, national team. And it just kept being like, they still haven't figured this out. So now here I am, I'm, I'm a head coach at the World Championship. I will tell you I was able to help the manager with laundry decisions. So my strengths got me there, but my focus shifted so far to what I perceived that I couldn't do well at this level, which mostly was the technical and tactical, that became such a huge focus for me. I lost myself and the team lost me too. I failed on the largest, I mean, for me, most public stage that there is. And it took a while, but I did lean in. I did feel all the feels that went along with it. And I came away with some unreal learning and reframed my perspectives. So for this section, I'd like to get real with what I looked like in my inauthentic coaching self. Some coaching strategies that we were able to use in the short term. And again, as I was sort of internally struggling through feeling overwhelmed a little bit, uh, that you might be able to employ. And then some mental performance pieces around perspective taking that are a lot more big picture. And they also seem really important in kind of to currently fit our state of affairs with, with COVID stuff. So the looking glass self, um, this is the idea that what I think think others think of me is is real right so it, it might be unproven you don't actually know what anybody thinks or expects of you but you experience it as so real I had ideas of what I thought a coach at this level looked at looked like acted like and so this started my performance I assumed everyone from my staff my players other coaches thought I shouldn't be coaching but we're just too nice to say it to my face I became so focused on the technical and tactical that I went away from things that made me me. Looking back, I knew I wasn't being myself, but I thought the alternative was better for the team, and so the act continued. I spent most nights trying to allow my rational mind to convince myself that people weren't actually thinking I sucked. I learned later, well, that is likely untrue. The emotional energy that I was spending trying to talk myself down just exhausting me and depleting me more. So that's where we're at. And we still have to play a world championship. What I led with here, again, with some vulnerability, asking my staff to, when I delegated it, it was real. It wasn't just lip service of like, oh yeah, you watch the defense. 
I really appealed to them. I, I need your help we, to be successful. We all really, we got to work together up here. Um, and they felt empowered to share and together we did come up with some great suggestions to manage some of this. Uh, and I highly recommend a bunch of them. So here's some ideas we employed. Filtering through the assistant on timeouts. When you've got a bunch of head coaches that are really experienced, they had a lot of thoughts. And so that was a lot to sift through at a timeout. And all of a sudden we're down to like 20 seconds. So Danny was our, our lead assistant at the time. She would kind of be making notes throughout and she would give me three things at the timeout that had come through everybody. Um, and, and basically it filtered it. So there was much less to have to sift through. Not everyone would do this. Something else we did in that scenario, the staff made subs. Now I still had veto power. I still had change power, obviously, but it allowed me to coach who was on the court without overanalyzing minutes at the cadet level. You're really trying to balance winning with competing hard. I'm a pleaser. So there was all these other things going on. It did free me up a little bit. Something else that was awesome was the sit down rule. And I think this was, I think this was Danny's idea. I'm a pacer by trade. So the rule was I had to sit down about halfway through the quarter to connect with the staff and check in. Now that alone is really good. It unifies us a little bit. But for me, it made me get out of my own head. It got me external. So instead of just what's turning, I had to get out and sort of hear and consider. And it was massively helpful. If you are, as I said, so I'm one, I don't want to, I don't know if it's an extreme or not, but I'm at one side. So presenting the other side, if you are not prone to self-doubt or second guessing yourself, while I envy you in so many ways, I also want to gently invite you to consider what you might be missing. So now what? So we lose with a very good team. I hardly recognized myself. I could no longer tell if that was a good thing or a bad thing. And we're flying home. It didn't feel good. It took some time to hunker down. Definitely having miniature kids helped ground me a little bit, gave me some perspective. But at the beginning, I couldn't even really talk about it much because I just, I couldn't even process what had happened. Sometimes sitting with it in stillness for a bit without dissecting it can be good even for you who is quite a verbal processor, I decided finally to take a look back and really inventory who am I in a stress and pressure environment. And the clues did become obvious. I highly suggest you do the same. More than narrow focused, it became evident that I went super internal as many athletes do as well. So for me, when I went back and watched video of this stuff, I could see it through my body, through my body posture, how I communicated. So like my, my muscles were clenched, my jaw particularly, my furrowed brow was happening all the time. I was flexing and clenching my hands. Um, time out trends. I think to illustrate this one, I'll give you an example. I can remember it pretty vividly irrespective of whether it was the right or wrong tactic, which we'll never really know, this was an, a timeout that I took that was reactionary. It was a knee jerk. It was close, it was late game, early round pool play. They got fouled on the shot. I took the timeout. Now, on a free throw, I could have spoken to them and it would have given me the opportunity to still advance the ball. Again, in this situation, I, I gave up that opportunity. There were some advantages to it just because of our personnel. Uh, and it guaranteed that I got the timeout in a free throw situation. But I still had to go back and own it because I knew I took it as something outside of our strategy, right? I took it because it was an emotional reaction. And that, that's not who I want it to be. Some other thing, pre-practice behaviors for me. I rarely shot with players in the national team environment. I rarely have to really remind myself and force myself to go and informally chat, which is usually what I like to do because I was so busy going over my notes and mentally rehearsing. In game, my coaching behaviors were very, very different. 
as a verbal processor, as I mentioned, who likes to teach through competition, I coach the bench a ton. I, I will miss at the OSBA level, I'll miss getting timeouts in sometimes because I'm at the other end of the bench coaching through it and then I'll run back and I'll have missed the possession. I love coaching through the bench. I think it, it keeps you connected. I think at the developmental level, it allows you to sort of focus what the players are looking at, think about how they're going to apply it to themselves. And even at like a high performance or an older level, I think it, it brings the players in as a bit of a collaborator. They know where your brain is at, which I think is pretty powerful. I hardly spoke to the bench at all in that environment, in the national team environment. The other one, I really like joking around and I just, I wasn't funny. Like I, and I couldn't even try to be. Um, the other piece, how do you react to someone who's questioning or challenging you? Why I'm bringing that up because as you've seen for me, that is explicitly something I want in our culture, in our environment. And I can remember, a beautiful hotel room nighttime coaches meeting we were planning the next game in our shoot around and a suggestion came up as they often did it started gaining some momentum as the other coaches agreed with the point super informal it's not like they were ganging up but they were just solidly arguing a point and i shut it down aggressively no we're not doing it for any of you that know me that was very very out of character so all of these were clues that I was in a bit of a bad place. Again, to give the other side of the spectrum now, for those of you who have had different experiences me, than me, think back to a time when you were unhappy with your performance or even your team's performance. And, and consider trying some of these to inventory your own performance. So who are you in a stress and pressure situation? Optimal performance zone. Again, take a second to just look at this rather than me explaining it all to you. I, I was in a pretty bad place. I was pretty far right of this. The major point and why I've chosen to, ex to include this little chart here a major point that I learned and I'm still working on. And anecdotally, I think we as coaches and as teachers struggle with this a ton. We have to stop wearing being busy and near burnout as a badge of honor. The grind now, I'll sleep when I'm dead, talk, behaviors, they're just not helpful. I'm really interested to see if our current state of affairs with COVID-19, if things change. I don't know, but definitely some learning. So here comes the big picture stuff. Renewal through reframing and perspective taking. These are what have not only sort of gotten me through, but helped me be better. Cue card people. This is a Brene Brown thing, and it's pretty brilliant. For anyone that, that, that says, who cares what other people think? Again, for the most part, really cool. But you know what? You do need to care who's, who's, what some people think, like maybe your employer or maybe your family. Like some people's opinion does matter. So for the cue card people, the people that you're going to fit on like a one-by-one one cue card are the most important. They're the people that the opinion matters and that you're probably even going to solicit. I like to think of it as a hype squad and your critical friend. The people on it that are your hype squad are the ones that give you borrowed courage. And we all need that sometimes. The critical friend, they're the ones that deliver information that you need based upon accumulated trust and mutual respect. Uh, early national team, we were in a training camp. Bryce Tully was our mental performance uh, consultant at the time. We had just been in a really like deep coaches meeting, going over a practice plan or something. And we rolled into dinner at, let's say, 6.12, and it had started at 6. So the kids are still working their way through line, like probably wouldn't have even noticed a blip on the radar. And yet quietly after, he just, he came and did a check-in with me. He said, is, is being on time something that's important to the team? And basically brought me back and, 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 and did a check-in, not from a place of judgment, um, 
but we had not met the agreement of our culture, which was to be on time. And I was incredibly grateful that he would have that conversation with me because it did bring it back. It's not okay. If that's something we say is important, we need to be able to do that. And I was so thankful that in that instance, he was somebody that I did care about their opinion and he was brave enough to share that with me and it did make us better. Another reframe, more than just trying not to care what other people think, I've gone even further with it. I assume someone thinks I suck or someone disagrees with every decision I make and I have found it very liberating. Now I'm not wasting any emotional energy thinking about it. I'm not saying this is a healthy one, but it really has helped me. If I assume, now I'm not trying to make everybody happy. Correlation is not causation. For wins or losses, when you win or when you lose, it might have nothing to do with what you did. Win or lose. Own it as a coach, but don't hang your hat on it as an enduring piece. This was another Bryce nugget that like blew my mind. Emotion and focus can coexist. An example of this, there's a girl on my team, she's just about to graduate, and she is known for being so nervous, like the, the puker, all of it. And when we started to work on this idea, and she's, she's bought into mindfulness and being able to sort of name a feeling, she could identify I'm getting nervous. She knew what the cues were, and she could feel it. And we moved to a place of going, cool, you're nervous. Great, we know that. That's fine. Now what do you, we need to go out and rebound. And it allowed her to be experiencing both things simultaneously. Anytime I've got the negative uh, self-talk stuff, I'm trying to redirect it again to what is my next correct decision to focus on. It takes me to a place of action as, a, as opposed to stewing, as you've probably figured out I do tend to do. Um, and then the other one, and this again is perfect for this time and place in our world, be stubborn in pursuit of your goals and flexible in your methods. So if I can plan for obstacles, I don't think any of us saw this coming, but it disarms their power all of a sudden. So now how can I keep growing and challenging myself without losing myself again? Motivation to learn requires humility. And I, I, these now are things that as I'm struggling with something, I come back to. These are grounders for me. I can't think of a better message to model in action than for me to be a learner. I also have to be humble enough to know I don't know it all. Where blame or excuses want to exist, use curiosity instead. Again, make yourself go, hmm, what's happening there? A boat is safe in the harbor, but that is not what boats are built for. You feel free to snap if you want to. Uh, this one, again, some of you totally find if you think it's hokey, I do too. But I've tried it and it's, it is helpful. Instead of just a to-do list where I'm going, I've got to have all the plays, blah, blah, blah. Remind yourself of who you want to be, so try using a to-be list. Reminder where shame exists. So if you're in such a bad place, you're, you're not going to be able to move on. If you can't move on, you're no good to your team. And sometimes fear doesn't go away, so we have to do things afraid. So instead of beating yourself up and going to guilt of, oh, I can't believe I'm feeling so uncomfortable, I should just be able to embrace it. No, like you might feel like that for a while. When you jump into your next new role or perceived higher role, I, I actually hope that you do feel some of this because it's, it's pretty fruitful. Make room for some self-compassion, I guess, is, is the, the punchline there. If you, can, if you can use bad things as motivation rather than looking at it as inadequacy, like that might, might be a good way to reframe. Big learning continued, getting close with time here, so I'm going to keep cruising along. These ones I just heard really recently, so I put another slide. Sometimes storms don't come to disrupt your life. They come to clear a path that you weren't aware of. 
I know for me, I make decisions differently now. Like I'm talking big life decisions after going through that. This one also was a big piece for me. Hope is a choice we must make each day if we are to be of service to others. This is not about the raw, raw positive or like neglecting reality. It's choosing to think that things can become better and I'd like to be involved with it. Again, if, if we think that that's 1% infectious to the young people we're working with, it's worth it. No. And then because, I mean, I don't know who I'm talking to. I can't see any of you, but I'm assuming there's young coaches and let's call you experienced coaches. It takes a village to raise a child. It also takes a village to raise a coach. If you're a mentor, remember this. And if you're a new coach, ask questions, share, screw up, figure out your coach. And all the way along it, figure out who are your coaching cue card people. And this, this is what I'm going to end you with. This changed everything for me. It was sent to me after that world championship by our amazing PA, Connor. Um, take a second to read it, please, if you don't mind. Not sure what level of readers we have, so I'm just gonna continue now. This might be overstating it, but I don't think it is. Coaching is a noble and brave pursuit. Thank you for your bravery. This quote is what helps me come back to my why and my who and make sure that it lines up with my what and my how. As we open it up to questions, I don't know if there's time, but I would love to hear about your personal. As you were reading this, I hope it brought to mind your man in the arena moment. And if it did, I'd love to hear not only what it was, but like what was your next, your next piece to it. Um, and finally, please get in touch with me if you want to. Uh, I'm happy to chat, I'm happy to send resources, um, and I'm so happy to have been able to share this with you. So thank you for your time, hand emoji. Thanks very much, Coach, that was fantastic, and uh, appreciate you and your willingness um, not only to share, but uh, to be as vulnerable as you were there over the last uh, 50 or so minutes. So thanks very much. Um, I'll lead us off with questions, and as they come in, uh, I'll throw them to you. But what is the balance that uh, you found now of, of how vulnerable you share these experiences with your athletes and within the team to build that trust versus them still having confidence in you uh, as their coach? So, oh man, I, I wrestle with that one for sure. Um, because you do still need to be seen as competent, obviously. Um, the balance is again, even for athletes, it's normalizing struggle. It's being able to highlight failure and the what next. And that, that should be almost happening. The idea of I can be better and I'm not satisfied, I think is happening all the time. So that's where my vulnerability um, leads me to without, I'm not, I don't know that they all know the story, even maybe to now the depth that you all do. Um, but they know that it was a, a massive learning experience. I speak about the national team stuff and the amazing opportunities that came with it and the hard, hard learning that I speak of in a way that I'm, I'm so blessed to have had it. And I speak in terms of, I wish for you because you can do hard things that you have an opportunity like that as well. So anytime that vulnerability enters my equation, when I'm around my athletes or my students, it's very much with a what next and why it matters uh, kind of piece that goes with it. Hopefully that answers the question. Uh, uh, that's great. Um, the next one that comes to mind is as you go from say a world championship then to, you know, the first practice of, of your high school team, <laughs> how different are, are things treated? Or I'm sure there are some similarities, but, but what, what can't you do with your high school team that you can maybe do with the national group and vice versa? 
Excellent question. Um, I'm going to answer it two ways. One, because I don't know exactly which uh, sort of silo they're looking at. One, coming off of like the tough world championship, I can tell you, and I really hope my players would back me up on this, there was a renewed focus on culture and relationships. For me, I had to get back to me. Um, and that I hope it did. It was different, but it wasn't meant to be. Like if I ever you know, went back to that environment, that, that would be something that needed to be more consistent and lateral. Um, but from a basketball standpoint, I would compare it to OSBA versus U Sports. So at team level versus my current team, the athleticism and size is through the roof. And at the OSBA level, we might have arguably overall higher level athletes. And again, size off the charts, but the depth of knowledge and, and how quickly concepts can be picked up is probably probably the biggest difference I would say but it's also out of necessity because in a training camp environment it's like boop, 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 put stuff in hope they kind of get it do your best to remediate 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 whereas over the course of a whole season obviously you can do things a little bit more slowly and be adding a little bit more deliberately okay uh from the uh, attendees here so when taking the approach of assuming someone thinks you suck uh, but you still have to have a professional relationship with that person. How do you approach conversations with that person? Excellent. Um, I'm guessing this meant when I was more in my inauthentic self and I was worrying about that as opposed to the statement about not everyone's going to be happy with my decision. It was hard. And I had the most wonderful women at this point on my staff. And we quite, we enjoyed each other's company. Like we had a good time and had some amazing off-court conversations. Professionally, it's just, I'm, that's probably, when you look at regret, that's probably my regret, is that I couldn't, I wasn't in a place to be able to engage and be the person I wanted to. I think we could have gotten so much more out of each other if I hadn't had such armor on. Um, so the professional conversations weren't difficult. I just was leaning into it as like three quarters of myself. 